but only the man with understanding can draw it out. If he tells me I know too much to die, that means my answer was from something inside there. So I just needed to know how to connect to that thing inside there, the counsel inside there. Because let me tell you, when the Bible says that counsel in the heart of man is as deep waters, but a man of understanding will draw it out, it means everything you ever need in God is inside you. The answer for the sickness you're dealing with, the answer for the trouble in your marriage, the answer for the trouble with your children, the answer for the trouble with your job, the answer for the troubles that you carry in life, they're inside there. But God says, but only a man of understanding can draw it out. There's a drawing out. There's a sudden drawing out. Don't expect that because you know, therefore you will not die. No. There has to be an understanding that has to reconcile with what you have in the inside for you to be able to get it out. Are you following what I'm saying? For you to be able to get it out. And I realize the mystery is understanding. He says, my son, with all I'm getting, get understanding. Because it's the realm that establishes all realities of truth. The Bible says, with wisdom a house is built, and with understanding a house is established. And when it is established, the Bible says, and then knowledge brings increase and fills the house with all precious treasures. So if you look at yourself as a house built by God, the Bible says you're a house built by God, it means that you, you, you were built by knowledge and understanding established you. It makes you steady so you do not fall. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And then knowledge brings in all that you need, verses 4. And with knowledge comes everything, all precious things, pleasant riches that fill the chambers of the house. That means, by the order of the spirit, knowledge does not come first to a man. What comes first? Wisdom. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. So you begin with wisdom, and then from wisdom, understanding, and then from understanding, you get to knowledge. You cannot know what you don't understand, and you cannot understand what you don't carry wisdom for. The problem with our people is that they think that through knowledge, they can get wisdom. And that's not how the pattern of the spirit works. Some of the things are, oh, because I'm sitting before a good teacher, therefore, I am getting, as I receive knowledge, therefore, I'm going to connect to the spirit of wisdom. Uh-uh. Rather, you receive wisdom and by wisdom you get understanding and from understanding you get knowledge are you following what i'm saying it's like if you're building a house if the precious riches that that fill the chamber of this house is knowledge it's the same order you started a building by foundation which was what wisdom and then you established it the pillars of understanding and once you roofed it, then you brought in your chairs, your bed, your cups, your kitchen setting, and everything. And that's what becomes the what? The house. We have people who have chairs and tables without buildings and foundations. Spiritually, that's how some of us are. And that's the truth. Or we have people who have built foundations but without the right pillars. And then they fill the house with all the chairs and tables and televisions. What happens? That house will collapse one day. The English call it a house of cards. It will fall. It will fall. And that is why some of us cannot keep our healings. Because of how we have built. Some of us cannot keep our marital commitments because of how we have built. Some of us cannot keep our ministries. It's built today, tomorrow it goes. You understand? small guy comes and breaks it by half and goes and then another one comes and breaks you understand because of how we have what built everything stands as far as it is built somebody shout hallelujah how have you built your financial life how have you built your physical life how have you built your social life how have you built your career life the way you have built is exactly how you will walk. It's exactly the results that you should expect as you have built. Don't expect results of building with wood or straw as 
a man who was built with gold. It doesn't happen. That's why Paul warned us. Take heed how you build. He says some will build with silver, some will build with diamond, some will build with wood, some will build with stubble, some will build with grass. He says, and a fire will come and test all these works to know what manner they are made of. Because there is always a devil coming to shed to see. When she said she's born again, did she mean it? When he said that he was praying, was he really praying? When they said that they saw the Lord, did they really see the Lord? See, there's a fire that will come to test what you claimed you knew by God. We have many Christians who are so good when they're on the altar. Have you noticed? Pastors, you know what I'm saying. If you want the guy to pray, put him on the altar and say, pray. Why? Because he can pray on the what? On the altar. But he can't pray at home. He can sing on the altar, but he cannot worship God in his closet. Do you understand what I'm saying? When people are watching, we can give big. Now, we need a fundraising of this and that. Can, can you put up your hands and tell us how much you're going to give? That's the day that brother is going to give $4,000, $50,000, dollars $100,000. That's the day that $200,000. Why? Because when the eyes are watching, they can give. Back in the day, back home, this guy used to make me laugh. You know those things where people used to come and sing and then people want to give them some? And so this guy would hold his money like this, coming laughing. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? He would hold the money so high that everybody would see, oh my God, this guy is giving 50000 just for a guy singing a song. <laughs> you know folk like that? <laughs> Who know just the art of creating the world they want people to think they belong to, but without a secret witness. Now, I always say, and I said it yesterday, that the Lord which sees you in secret will reward you openly. That's how God works. If you learn the secret things of God, you'll always have open reward. That's why I always tell people there is no man with an open experience of fruit without a secret place with the Almighty. You see, many times now we have, the, the, we, we are as if we're putting makeup on our praise and our worship and our seeding and our, everything that we're doing is like, it, it carry, it's without, it's not within, it carries no inward experience of a true connection with, all, with the Almighty. And no wonder we're living superficially. Christianity has become superficial with certain folk. Uh, oh my goodness, you saw it in COVID. Guy says, no, my God, I cannot fall sick. I cannot fall sick. I cannot fall sick. Then somebody next to them, next to them copes. Then it's fire in the name of Jesus. Far from me. Far from me. And they're like, oh, brother, you said that 10,000 shall fall at one side and 1,000 on the other and none of these things shall by any means come near you. <laughs> And then you find Christians putting on four masks. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and for my wife. <laughs> and then they're walking in the mall, they can't breathe. <laughs> Why? Because they have what? Four masks. And then, so I asked one of the believers, I said, but you say it, you believe. And he said, no, but you know you don't tempt God. <laughs> so, you see, let me tell you, pastors, this might not be a popular Something has come in what we call neo-Pentecostalism. And it's bigger in America than many parts of the world. Where there is a false wisdom that's really driven by the spirit of fear. And men call it wisdom of faith. But it's not wisdom. My goodness, let us go just a few years back. John Zilex lived in a plague. And when a plague hit that nation, he carried men with plagues and he was helping them carry dead bodies to cars. And they asked John Zilex, how come you're not falling sick? And he said, I'll explain why. He told them, get a what? A microscope. And get the germs off a dead guy with a plague and put those germs on my body and see what will happen. 
it was an open experiment. Doctors got plagues of dead people, put them under a microscope on the hand on John Gillex, and the report was every germ that touched him immediately died. If John Gillex lived in neo Pentecostalism, he would not touch a dead body. Listen, I walked in hospitals in the time when COVID was at its most. That's when I asked hospitals to invite me. And I entered and I was laying hands. Are you hearing me? And my heart was telling me I cannot die of COVID. I cannot die of COVID. I cannot die of COVID. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they call it, they call it wisdom, but, but it's really fear. It's false wisdom. It's false wisdom. It's false wisdom. Let God be true and every man a liar. If the government told me put on a mask, I'll put it on. Because the Bible says, obey the king for the sake of your vows towards God. That's the only reason why I put on a mask. Not because I was going to get COVID, but because I have to obey the king for the sake of my vows before God. It's wisdom to say the government has said so I'm going to wear it. But I'm not wearing that mask because I think it's the only thing that's going to keep me from COVID. No! I'm doing it for the Lord. And my vows towards God. That's why when they closed our churches, some of our pastors opened theirs. I didn't open my church until the day the government said open your church. Why? Because of my vows toward God that I have to obey my king. I must be in agreement with the law of my country. Are you hearing me? But if they gave me a choice and say, those who think you'll fall sick, put on, and those of you who think you won't fall sick, you would not see that thing on that mouth. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let God be true and every man a what? A liar. And you know, right now I know there's a health professional looking at me saying, this guy has no clue what he's talking about no I do because I have prayed for a dead body and it came to life <laughs> there is no treatment of a dead body I do because I've prayed stage 4 cancers out of people terminal so I know what I'm talking about yes we've gotten people out of palliative care so I know what I'm talking about if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead resides inside you. The Bible says he will give your mortal bodies life. Do not forget that that same spirit that raised him from the dead is inside your veins. It's in your blood. It is in your body. It's inside your system. Does that mean you might not find yourself sickly? Yes. You might find yourself sickly. But it means when you feel it, you should know how to come out. Thanks be to God which always causes us to triumph. And makes manifest the summer of his knowledge by us in every place. I cannot fall sick. I refuse to be sick. No, what if you say it and tomorrow you wake up with pain? Keep saying it. What if you wake up and, and you worsen? If the disease worsens, you also worsen. Some of you don't know how to deal with the devil. If he brings it, you bring it on. He, he hits up, you hit up. I tell people the devil can fight hard, but he cannot fight longer. At one point, one of you has to lose the battle. Somebody shout hallelujah. Thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph. Always. Always. I said always causes us to triumph always causes us to triumph always causes us always 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 as the guarantee that nothing that is coming ahead that I won't have an answer for however crazy it looks like I will have an answer whether it comes from up or left or right it will still come Whatever is set before me, I know that I have victory even before it comes. Do you know what it's like for somebody to be diagnosed of a disease and you come out? I, I tell you, some of us, like I said, we don't teach things we don't know. 
We don't teach things we don't know. I'm telling you those days I used to fall sick. A woman gave me a report and told me you have this. And I told her, no, I don't. She told me you do. And I told her, no. <laughs> then as I was standing up, she realized something was wrong with me. She asked me, what are you going to do? I told her, I'm going to get it out. I'll have to preach it out if you think it's there. But I don't believe I'm sick. I cannot fall sick. I don't fall sick. I don't. I, ooh, I spoke, I spoke, I spoke, I spoke. She was going to admit me that day. She told me, your heart, your heart cannot move out of this, this hospital. You're going to fall dead. What we see with your body, you're going to fall dead. I said, what? They told me, you're going to fall dead now. Then they told me, we're going to admit you. And I said, who, me? And she said, yeah, you. And I said, oh, kako bara negozi. I told her I can't fall sick. No, no, I'll get it out. Do you know what I did? The woman warned me that even by walking, it was dangerous. I went and got running shoes. The next day, I put on my shorts, T-shirts, and I'm putting on my running shoes. And my mom asks me, what's happening? Tell mommy you can't understand. I'm going jogging. You can't understand. I'm going jogging. But you don't jog. I told her, you cannot understand this. I got my sneakers, put them on, and I started running. Devil, you said I shouldn't walk. Now I'm running. One kilometer, devil, you said I shouldn't walk. Now I'm running. Two kilometers, devil, you said. And the more I thought about it, the more angry I became. And the angry I became, the faster I ran. Until I started sweating. And the faster I ran, the angry I became. Ah! Thanks be to God. And my body started healing. And healing. And healing. And healing. Now I play basketball three times a week. Four hours. Three to four hours. Non-stop. A person whom they want could not even, should not even be walking. The devil is a liar. And his mother-in-law. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Some of you, the reason why you're going to die early is because you're not crazy enough for the devil. You're too sympathetic and conformed. If they say you have this, you just take it. No! 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 Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout glory to God. So the question was, why is it that some people find answers and some don't? Fundamentally, there are principles in prayer. There are dimensions of prayer. There are ways of prayer. So when the disciples of Jesus ask him, teach us to pray. Fundamentally, God was trying to tell you and I that it's important not just to pray, but to know how to pray. How to pray. How to pray. It's a topic I've taught in many ways. I have some called prayer codes. They're about eight or nine. And God keeps opening and opening up these places that many of us took for granted. But they were given to us to know how to pray. I'll give you one of them. I'll give you one of them. James chapter 5 verse 16. Famous scripture. If you will read um, from the Amplified Version. If you don't have it, don't worry. We knew that you don't carry your Bibles these days. So we asked the lady somewhere to give it to us here by faith. I hope it's there. I might say all these things. Eh? Thank you, Jesus. All right. The Bible says, confess to one another, therefore, your what? And your, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. And pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual turn of mind and heart. That's not where I wanted to preach. What I wanted to preach is the next line. Let's read. One, two, three, let's go. The honest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power 
available, dynamic in its working. Let's read it one more time. The honest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its work. You didn't get it? That's why I'm explaining. So you get it. I'm going to explain. Now, the Bible says, if it say that the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a man makes tremendous power available and dynamic in its working, I would not be able to teach it like I'm going to teach it now. But he has said, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man. He didn't say a believing man. He said a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. That means that the way of prayer, okay, like I said, it has degrees, all right? There's that prayer of, of, of fellowship with the Father. Uh, you know, there's, there's a degree of prayer of, of worship and adoration and just to be and bask in the presence of God, that place of transaction, the law of translation is there. You are in the presence deep with God and and, and then you are you enjoying, you know, who he is and what he is to you. The Bible says, I pray that I may know him even as I'm known by him. You understand that kind of relationship where you are, you know, in that place, you're not asking for healing or this or whatever. You're just there. You're in the presence of God. Praise the Lord Jesus. And then there is that prayer that comes to deal with an issue, disease. You know, bondage, trouble, demonic activity, that kind of thing. It's another kind of prayer. If you look at Jesus Christ dealing with the sick, even though we use the word prayer, Jesus never really prayed the way people say to pray for the sick. If you look at how Jesus did his miracles, he was not the kind who say, Father, this man has suffered for so long. Koka Baba, Koba. We are kneeling before you. And then you get all these combobulating vocabularies of the spirit realm. Because you think that by joining these words, it means that you're launching to a deeper realm of authority. Let me tell you. Jesus finds a dead girl and he says, Talitha Kuma. And then she's out. <laughs> Receive your sight. And then they receive it. Be healed according to your faith. One sentence. And then you find people praying for four hours to get things out of their body. When this man just spoke a word and at that speech everything was fixed. I'll tell you why. Because when Jesus came in the realm of the miraculous, when he entered the realm of the miraculous, the power was available. The Bible says he went to a city and the power to heal was available. That means he had already prepared his closet. By the time he's coming to the sick, he... Ooh, 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 ooh. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let's read. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the Lord sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal. Did he pray for power? No, the power to heal was present. Listen, he says the fervent prayer, heartfelt prayer of a righteous man availeth much power, dynamic in nature. So he comes in a meeting as he's teaching the power is already available. Somebody shout hallelujah. As he comes to teach the word, the power was already available. So as he's teaching, people are healing. Not because he's praying for the sick, but because the power to heal was present. These men learned the secret of prayer to avail enough power, not static, but that becomes dynamic in its working. In other words, when the power is available, if you are not sick but you need a financial breakthrough, it is dynamic enough to shift from healing to financial provision. If your issue was a marital issue, it is dynamic enough to shift from the healing to fix your marriage. Because it is dynamic in nature. 
If your issue is depression, it can come and meet you at depression. Enter a woman with cancer and heal her. Enter a man with a broken marriage and restore it. Enter a child with, uh, you know, uh, focus issues and fix them. Enter a woman with, 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 uh, with demon spirits possessed and fix them. Mental health, fix it. And then it enters somebody with a rent issue and pays it. And then goes into somebody's house with a debt issue and pays it. All you needed was to avail the power. And he said that that's the realm we're supposed to be functioning in. Availing enough power to work and fix whatever is supposed to be fixed. When you learn that mystery, you become a walking miracle. Are you following what I'm saying? You will become like a charged current. You're charged all the time that you don't even need to pray for the spirit of God to move. I can say two words and mess this room up in just seconds. And when you do that, they say, ah, oh, is that of God? Is that of God? Is that the Holy Spirit? How come we, the Holy Spirit does not move like that in my pastor's church? Because it has to meet, move like the way he moves under your pastor's church for it to be the Holy Spirit. If they move that way, then he's not the pastor of the Holy Spirit. No, it's because you know him only the way you have seen him. But he's not limited to how he works. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout much power is available with me. And he says, the secret here was a righteous man. Now let's have that conversation. Let's have that conversation in a few minutes. See, when we talk about righteousness through faith, when we talk about the righteousness through faith, the righteousness of faith, some people think it's just a doctrinal thing to fight over and contend over. Some people don't see the power of this thing. But God has told you that the secret is here. A righteous man. So, in our days of the law, they used to tell us, this is what you have to do to become righteous. And then they put a list for us to become righteous. And then we did everything in the book to become righteous. And after we did everything in the book we know to become righteous, we go to God with pale lips and dry throats because we are fasting for 20 days. And then we ask for something and there is no answer. Then you say, but I fasted. Oh, but I prayed. Oh, but I did this. Oh, but I did that. How come I did not see the results that I asked God for? Because you got it wrong. You got it wrong. And much as people talk about righteousness, just as you know, many people just leave it in the realm of doctrine. Oh, the doctrine of righteousness, of faith. Or of God righteous versus the righteousness of men and, and some scream oh I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus so I believe in the righteousness imputed on me by faith and many of us have understood that doctrine but we have had, not had the experience of its revelation we have understood the doctrine but we have not had the experience of its revelation that is why men who really don't understand the difference between these two things. Men which really are so stuck in the law hardly see the miraculous on their lives. Why? Because the Bible says that the law produces priests with infirmities. The word infirmities there means weakness. That's what the law does. Are we against the law? No, we're not against the law. The problem is some of us, we fed so much on the law that we don't understand the work of grace. But anybody who talks about grace must be telling you to sin, to go sleeping around, wasting your life, yeah, because you're under grace. And that's what they say about people who preach the grace of God. And that's wrong. How, would, how do we keep wives? How do you keep a wife for years when she knows that I can sleep around and do anything as long as I'm under grace? You're the sick one, not me. Do you understand what I'm saying? The grace of God cannot be a license of sin. That's wrong. You're just not listening. Listen and understand what we are really saying. Paul taught the same message in Romans 3.8. He 
He says, some say that we say that let us do evil so good should come. Whose damnation is just. Can you believe the same Paul they are quoting? The same St. Paul they are quoting. One time preached the same message. And he says, and not as rather as we are slanderously are reported. And some affirm that we say, let us do evil so that good may come. Then a man sat in Paul's meeting. And after a whole sermon said, this guy is telling people to sin. He sat in Paul's meeting. And then he came out and said, this guy is telling people to sin. I, he says, and some affirm. That means somebody sat in there and said, I tell you I was in the room. <laughs> they slap like this. Like African men going for war. I tell you I was, I was in the room. I wish somebody just told me I was there. I had it with my seven ears. <laughs> Where are those? The rest of the five are. The man said. And I said, oh, no, no, no. That's not what he meant. Were you there? No. And me, I was there. I had him. A man had Paul say that we should do evil. So good should come. A man even said, he, he affirmed it and said, me, I was there. I was in that meeting. He said, let us see him. So, let me tell you the yardstick of knowing that a man is preaching Paul's message. If they can misquote him. If a man can't be misquoted, he's not preaching from Paul's books. He stayed in Moses. But when you come to the New Testament, a certain spirit will sit on some individual and make them say that you have said. So that conversation for anybody who is studying this doctrine, you should expect to hear it. Are you following what I'm saying? And if you're a pragmatic, one or two dimensional, chances are that you're the same kind who believe that everything said on CNN is true. <laughs> you know, there are people who don't, who don't think. Say, but if they've said this, what, what is the fruit? What, what is the logic of this? They don't think through. If you tell them that that guy turns into a snake next week, what? I already suspected his eyes. There's the way his eyes look. <laughs> Those are the kinds of people you're talking about. <laughs> so one day one guy came and told me, man, I was warned about you. They told me in your living room you have a big snake this big. I said, me? He said, yeah, it's a big thing like this. It's in your living room. So I said, this guy, this guy who told you, as if it's in my home. No, but they tell him that there's a big snake. So I asked him, so my daughter sits on it and then the snake starts trying <laughs> So my daughter doesn't have a toy. She has a big snake riding in the living room. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? <laughs> People have visions. But that's not why I came to speak today. Concerning visions, it shall be another day. But back to what I'm trying to tell us here. You're missing the point. He's saying, I am... I'm trying to define a righteous man to you. Because if you don't understand how this thing works, you'll not avail much power and make it dynamic in its nature. Now, if a man has not understood this righteousness, go back to that portion of scripture. It doesn't matter how heartfelt his prayer is. If a man has not understood this mystery, it does not matter how fervent his prayer is. If a man has not understood this mystery, it does not ha matter how many times he continues to pray this prayer or how many years he prays it. It will not work. Oh, this man prays. We have prayed. Oh, yes, they do. But they pray and die. And we bury them. And they say, but, but she was a praying woman. Yes, uh, but she has died. Even when she was, let me tell you. There are principles. You see, like, I'll give you an example. Let me read for you a portion of scripture that annoys me every time I read it. And I know it shall annoy you too. It shall annoy you too. Principles are principles. Patterns are patterns. Spiritual laws are spiritual laws. Ecclesiastes 7 verses 15. Let me read for you something here. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 7 verses 15. Let's read. One, two, let's go. 
All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perishes in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in wickedness. Two men. One guy is righteous, the other one is wicked. But the righteous man dies tomorrow. And the wicked man lives up to 90. And read that language again. He says, and a wicked man that prolongeth. No, the Bible didn't say wicked man whose days are prolonged. Oh! The guy is wicked, but he knows how to live long. And this righteous man. Do you understand? So, if you, if you must understand the, the law of life. God has said that I'm not going to break my law because you're right in your righteousness. If this man has the right confession and you have a negative one, believe me, that doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to die next week. You know, we have guys who don't know God, but they confess positively. All the time, I cannot die. I'm going to make it anyway. I'm going to find a way. And then you find people who are righteous, they're spirit-filled, they're serving in church, but they have the worst mouth you could ever find. In New England. I don't know what I'm going to make it next week. Oh, will I cross that road? Oh, the gas prices have gone to up. Shall we drive cars? Fire your mouth! What do you mean? When the gas prices go up to $100 a gallon, you will drive that car. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And then you find a man who doesn't know God. But then he just says, yes we can. And it works. And then you find a Christian saying, it can't work. It won't work. No way. It's not going to work. How? I don't see the way. No. This, this, no. It's going to sink. No. It doesn't work. I don't see it. No. It, listen. The Bible says. That you shall eat of the lips of your words. Do you know what it means? It means that if you live confessing negatively, it doesn't matter how righteous you are, you will die. Oh, you know, I'm old. One time I was talking to a girl. She's, what, 39? I told her, check this for me. She says, uh, I need to remember, you know I'm growing old. What? Let me tell you, in this dispensation, 60 is the new youth. When you make 60, they say, no, he's a youth. 60 is the new youth. Somebody shout hallelujah. My mother is 71, but she still runs, jumps, plays with my nieces. No disease on her body. No disease. No, nothing. She check her blood, there is nothing on her body. She's 71. Running, playing with my nieces. She dances in the church and goes back home healthy. 71. Nothing is bent. Today you find 50 year olds are walking like this. Somebody shout hallelujah. You speak to your body, you speak to your bones, you speak to your kidneys. You talk to yourself and say, by God I must move, by God I must walk. This is the life of God in me. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Greater is he which is in me than he which is in the world. I shall live to see my children and my children's children. I cannot bend now, not now. Hallelujah, glory to God. And you keep saying it. Somebody shout hallelujah. Yes, take your seats. You. So, this hurt me. That a, a righteous man perishes in his righteousness and a just man, uh, uh, an, a, a wicked man prolongeth his days. Now, do you realize when you go back to Ecclesiastes, the righteous man perishes in his righteousness, not the righteousness of God. <laughs> Slap somebody and tell him I've understood it. The righteous man perishes in his righteousness. Can I tell you another person of scripture? 
that shocks me. There's a portion that says that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom before you. Oh, heaven will shock people. Heaven will shock people. <laughs> Some people will be in heaven and they will be, but that woman was so wicked. And then as they enter, they're next to St. Paul. What's up? <laughs> heaven. The Bible says the publicans and the harlots go in the kingdom of God before you. Is he saying we should be publicans? Now there's somebody who is going to go back and say, the guy says harlots will go before us. No. <laughs> I know how people think. I know how some of you think. I was in a meeting, this guy said that prostitutes are the ones who go to heaven. The rest of us don't. Ah, man of God. Now I'm telling you, I know how people think. Did I quote the scripture? Yes. But somebody can carry different revelation about this and bring me in trouble. When he came to New England, he told us, all prostitutes will go to heaven except us. Ah, brother, is that what he said? I was there. Eh. Were you there? No, me, I was there. I had the guy. <laughs> Somebody shout amen. amen. No, God is not saying that you should be a harlot. No. He's trying to tell us something deeper that many of us have failed to get because you're interpreting Greek, Hebrew, ninth dimension and sixth dimensional languages in a fourth or third dimensional language. That's a problem with why many people cannot interpret scripture. Because English is what? Fourth dimension or third, fourth dimension. You're there. You either have to boil for, borrow from Latin or French or what. You understand? And some of other languages, they're even more pragmatic than that. They're one or two dimensional. So they can't even ex explain deeper contexts of language. So we even still have a language issue. We still have a, a what? A language issue. But even Jesus dealt with it. Break down this temple and I'll build it in three days. Do you know how long it took us to build this temple? It was 40 something years. How are you going to build? And the Bible says, and they knew not that he spoke concerning his body. Oh God. And the Bible says, even to us, and he says, without a parable, speak he not unto them. So, he's already complicated. And in the demystification of his person, he again speaks parables. And hidden sentences. It's already complicated what's already complicated. And he's trying to tell them, no, the parables were the simpler ones. If they didn't get it from that realm, they might not get it forever. The kingdom of God is likened unto. So, he's, he's, he's giving them... He's trying to help them create a world that is easy for them because that's all they know. And some people think that that's where God teaches from. No, that's not where God teaches from. It's because they're not able to come up hither. They're not ready or able to come up to where he is to really see things as they must appear. So he tells Moses, build this temple according to the vision I've shown you at the mountain. So Moses builds the temple at the vision, as the vision God has given him at the mountain he builds the holy of holies he builds the holy place and the outer court and then go down as that presence and he comes and dwells among them and then they realize when you build the holy of holies a holy place and an outer court i will dwell there and then paul went to the same place and he says but god does not dwell in temples built by human hands so he dwells in temples built by himself okay the revelation is progressing and then john the revelator goes to the same place and he says and i reached there and there was no temple <laughs> and he says but god the father jesus he was the temple thereof. That in 
in the simplest terms, he was God, but he would not reveal himself to Moses that way because Moses was not able to understand him that way. So he gives him a picture of a temple because that's where Moses was able to understand him. And if Moses built a monument there, if Moses built a monument there, then the, the church or the, the children of God will not have progress to the deeper places of knowing God. Why do you think Satan, of all bodies he could fight for, he fought for Moses' body? Do you know what Moses represented in the spirit realm? That Satan would say he's dead, but I can still use this body for something. What was he looking to use this body for? Ask yourself. How come he's never looked for any other body to fight for since Moses' day? Because he knew what Moses had brought on the earth. And then he contended, the archangel Michael, when he contends with the devil, he disputes about the body of Moses. He says, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but say, the Lord rebuke thee. God has to come through this and stop you, but you're not taking this man's body. God had to bury Moses himself and hide his body. Because it was important, some of you do not have a clue what this body would have become if Satan had held it in his hands. He would have built a monument that would have killed the revelation of God in the earth for many years and the Lord knew it because there were many ways to kill men through Moses. One, the mystery of the veil. Why Paul later says that every time Moses is read, read the veil covers their eyes. It's a place of vision. It's a place of vision. It's a place of vision. But number two, what if the revelation of God had stayed on where Moses had seen him? And it had not transcended to where John had gone to find that there was no temple. But God himself was the temple thereof and the sun that shined. Where was mankind going to be? Imagine a monument that would pause history and the way of God only on Moses. Moses did his part, but God wanted to do way more than what he did through Moses. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Shout glory to, God. glory to God. So this is a serious thing for some of you to ponder. But let me go deep. Because I want to finish and pray with you. A fervent prayer. <laughs> a fervent prayer. So that you see something happen in your life this week, this month, this year, that was impossible. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, the Bible tells us in Kararogotiga uh, Dalade, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1. He says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, listen, we have obtained like precious faith. Through, the Bible says, through what? Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus. Now, he's talking about the righteousness of God. And he says, with this righteousness of God, we have obtained like precious faith. That means, when they say, believe God, have faith in God. He's saying that there is faith only that can come through the righteousness of God. That without that righteousness, you're, you will agree with your mind and think that you have believed in your spirit. Some people are struggling with mental assent. Their minds agree with scripture. And then they say, but I believed. How come it's not working? No, your mind agreeing doesn't mean that your spirit has believed. The difference between your mind believing and your spirit agreeing is that you will see the results of your faith when it comes from the inside, not from here. And many people believe from here and they believe from here and confess from here this is going to work it's this i'm healed and things are going to work my husband's going to come back my kids are going to be healed and then you spit all these things that look so beautiful but nothing is changing you know why because your mind is agreeing your spirit is not there how do you connect to the spirit through the word 
It's by understanding the righteousness of God. Paul says when we understood the righteousness of God, we obtained like, and I love use the word, precious faith. The word there, precious, means costly faith. We obtained expensive faith. We obtained costly faith. We obtained faith that was not ordinary. And that's the mystery that grows faith. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in that gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Therein is the righteousness of of God, not of men. The righteousness of God, not of men. The righteousness of God, not of men. The righteousness of, of God revealed from faith to faith. That means when a man connects to this reality, not only will you start being walking in activated faith, you're going to come from one level of faith into the next level of faith, from the next level of faith. Your faith, everybody will look at you and they'll see your faith growing. One year you could believe for this and the next year you're believing for that and the next week you're believing for that and the next month you're believing for that. From one level of glory to another level of glory. When a man is in that kind of trajectory, so is the path of the just. The Bible says they shine brighter and brighter. The longer they live, the brighter they shine. That kind of man has results of progress every day day they know they'll do better tomorrow they know their business will become bigger next week they know next month their career will advance they know their ministry must live one level to another level they understand the mystery of from faith to faith but you see do you know how many christians live they it works today tomorrow it fails then today it works, and then tomorrow it fails. It's faith, and then grass, and then it's faith, and then grass, and then it's faith, and then grass, and then it's come, it, 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 it comes to work, and then today it fails to work. And then today the miracle happened, tomorrow the miracle didn't happen. And then you're leaving this, you just one step in front, another step back. Another two steps in front, and then another step back. And then two, three, four, five steps, and then another step back. And, and, and you don't know that you are aware the last step backward you made. It doesn't matter how many steps you made in front. Because a man can make 10 steps forward and still make 10 steps backward. That's how many Christians live. Oh, you should have seen me in 2000. Gwei, I had money. Don't joke with me. Don't show me money. Don't throw around your money. I had money. I tell people the mystery of wealth is not having a hundred million dollars on your account. You are poor at the moment you cannot access the next dollar, even when you are a hundred million dollars richer. Because the mystery is not in how much you have. The mystery is how much you can access. There's a man with a hundred million dollars right now, and that's the last he's going to have. Just won a lottery. Just going to take a few weeks, and that man is going to go decimating, dwindling to zero. And there's a man right now who makes 20 or 50 or 100 dollars every day, and he's going to continue growing. One day these two men will meet somewhere. Because it's never about how much you have. It's always about how much you can access. The power to access is an integral part of a successful ministry. A successful business. A successful career. A successful dream. A successful aspiration. To be able to know that if I want this, I know how to access it. If I need joy, I know how to get it. If I need peace, I know how to get it. If I need healing, I know how to get it. If I need a breakthrough, I know how to get it. If I need a vision, I know how to get it. If I need power, I know how to get it. If I need an anointing to move this, I know how to get it. That's understanding the way of the Lord. He said, I am the way. The truth and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. But he said, I am that way. You must understand the way things work. So he says, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. 
Oh, and they don't understand how important it is to connect to this righteousness. They're praying, but they're not righteous. Or they're not, they don't, they're not connected to that righteousness. They're not positioned right spiritually. And they answer, ask themselves why they're not answering. And then they think that because they've put on a midnight hour with a special man of God from Trinidad, and he starts speaking special words. You, you, some of you have I've met people who put on YouTube pray, praying summons, praying videos. And then you put on a praying video of a guy who, who went, got a piece of pen and paper, and through art, started creating semantics, words and vocabulary to construct them right, to guide your spirit to pray because you carry no language. Why? Because the relationship with God is superficial. And then they write these things down and then write four or five pages and then they start. You are read from this. You are delivered from the power of this, from the struggles of this. And everything is just a confession of a man who has not even lived or even walked in the same realities of answers. And then somebody puts it on YouTube and they think that because they are confessing these things, I am this, I am blessed, I am righteous. It's just enough. No, you can speak all of that stuff all you want and still go back with the same attitude. Same sickness, same poverty, same trouble, same attack, same witchcraft that has, that has look, uh, pursued your family for centuries. Because you don't understand that there's a point where salvation must become personal. Where? You must get to a point whether your pastor said or he didn't say. Whether your man of God pointed at you in the service or he didn't. Whether they gave you a prophetic word or they did not. Whether they mentioned your name or they didn't. Whether that day the pastor preached on your issue or they preached on your neighbor. Whether the pastor came or did not come. Whether they understand you or they don't. You must be able to get yourself in a place and fix yourself and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And then you start to shanda, Marco Paradega, in righteousness. The Bible says, thou shall be a Published, and you shall be uh -huh. Who knows the person, how that person of scripture ends in righteousness thou shall be established uh -huh. uh? Uh? who knows that person of scripture say it no 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 that's Isaiah no 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 okay let's read mm -hmm. and for and for he says in righteousness you shall be established and you shall be far from oppression <laughs> some of you are putting I put walls hedges hedge me in Holy Spirit no listen this is your wall. This is your hedge. He said in righteousness you shall be established. And you shall be far from oppression. Oh no, 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 no. Give me the amplified version of that person of scripture. You're going to hear how beautiful it is. Amplified version of that. So beautiful. Come on. One, two, three, go. Huh? Mm-hmm. No destruction. Let me explain it. You cannot imagine yourself dying in a car accident. You know there are people who have all these kinds of thoughts. <laughs> they sit there and then they see their mother dying, their father dying, all their children dying, everything dying, and they don't know that the moment you started thinking it, you were creating. Job said, for the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. That means Job sometimes would sit there and imagine the thought when all his children are dead. And then we imagine it, he just shakes his head. I'm hungry. Then he leaves it there. Job used to think, ah, oh, I imagine when all my family is gone. Give me that portion of scripture. We're going to come back to Isaiah 54. I want to finish, but I, I, I have a lot to say. Now you tell me what to do. Listen, I'm traveling more than 3,000 miles back home. So be patient with me. You live just two blocks away. Yeah. 
Job said, for the thing, okay, give me the amplified. I, I prefer the amplified. Give me the amplified version of that, 325. We're going to come back. Now, some of you ask yourself, why did the devil kill Job's, uh, jo uh, Job's why, uh, children? Why did he kill his animals? Why did he take this guy's health? Why was he, you know, why did he get boils? Read. Next slide, 26. Does it have another verse? Huh? Uh huh. That's my point. The man is not quiet about it. He thinks it, he fears it, and voices it. So, Job was the kind who would be drinking wine with his friends and says, my God, I imagine when my children have died. Oh, it's a bad thing to have as a parent. <laughs> and then God said, have you considered my servant Job, who is righteous? And Satan tells him, yes, he's righteous. He lives righteous. But his thoughts are not. He lives righteous. But his words are not. Everything, he lives righteous. But he's fearful. Yeah, he's righteous. He lives good. He doesn't sin, but he's fearful. He lives righteous, but he thinks negatively. He lives righteous, but he confesses negatively. So Satan says... I have the right to that because you know in all the righteousness he can move into you know I have a right to deal with such a fellow because he has not tamed his thoughts and that's exactly what the devil came for everything he was greatly afraid of happened he always feared boils they came to him do you know that day you became so conscious about COVID was the day you got it <laughs> study yourselves you were okay, and then one day you stopped checking in, and then the day you became so conscious. <coughs> and, and they make me laugh when they say, I don't know how it came. I, I put on my masks. <laughs> I sanitize. Exactly what I'm saying. No, no, I know I'm speaking a very contrary message. And not because I'm wrong. But because you've had the wrong thing for so long, so I, I, I might sound wrong to you. This is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth that will make you free. So, you no, go back. He says, when a man is established in righteousness, he shall be far even from the thought of oppression. You can't think yourself sick. You can't think your wife leave you. You can't think your children. You can't. You can't. Oh! You can't. But the people who are tormented by thoughts of things that have not yet happened, and every time they're meditating them day and night, and then you ask yourself why trouble never leaves your house. I'm helping somebody. This moment was worth it for you. Somebody shout hallelujah. The righteousness of God establishes you. And the word establishing there is understanding. It gives you, it gives you a life of, of, of fearlessness. You stop imagining the worst about everything and everybody. But there are people, everything you think that guy might kill me. Yeah, yeah, fine, this man is me. I think, I think this guy's going to shoot me any day. You understand? Whatever you think. Somebody asked me, why don't you walk with a bodyguard? And I asked them, what am I protecting myself for? He asked me about a pastor of your caliber. I asked them, what would I be protecting myself from? Because I carry no consciousness of a man pursuing me to hack me. It's not in my head. Hey, man, you're proud. Eh? No, I'm not proud. <laughs> in righteousness, you shall be what? And you shall be far from even the thought of oppression or destruction. For you shall not fear, and from terror it shall not come near you. Thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph and makes manifest the savour of his knowledge.
by us in every place. I'm going to show you one more scripture and then we'll pray. So if you're the kind who wakes up at night to think about your kids and how they'll sleep or who will marry them or what they'll eat tomorrow, the problem is not your mind. The problem is the doctrine you have in your head. If you change the doctrine, you will sleep. And when you'll sleep, you'll allow God to work. Because God cannot work with your fears. You must cast out fear first. Perfect love casteth out all fear. One time a man wrote a very bad article in my nation. And it came in a very bad time. It was a flood. It was bad. It was scandalous. It came on a news tabloid. The next day, the news sex cult in Uganda. They took pictures. They wrote things. They, they wrote everything. And that time I, I, I was driving back home and one pastor got an article, that very article, and read it live on radio and preached against me. And then I met men who were my friends and I thought they should understand me. And they turned and, and, and nobody was to, I was, there was nobody I would turn to at that particular point who understood me. It was a hard time for me, my family, are people. I cannot tell you. And in one month, we lost 400 members. And I remember preaching that day. One week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And then this Sasha girl said, Papa, for a whole month now, there are 400 chairs that are empty. And people were leaving. Because they read. Because people are like that. They just read something and leave. Even Jesus was left at one point. <laughs> By the time the son of God asks, are you also going to go? I mean. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, unkept. Pun intended. Now listen. I remember telling her. And then she said, what do we do, Papa? Tell us what you want us to do. Because I have that kind of people. They ask me, what do you want us to do? And they will do it. I told him, such battles are not for you to fight. It was a November dead coming into December. And we had about two weeks to close into December, then open the next year. I told her, these kinds of attacks are not for you to fight. They're not for you. But we can mobilize and bring members back, but this kind of war is not the kind of war that should be won because you mobilized another 400 to return. I told her, give me up to February. I told her, we'll fix it. Man of God. Man of God. I remember praying before God. And then he started to confirm and affirm his love for me. And the grace by which he called and anointed me. And the reason why he chose me. And he spoke things. And I remember basking in the rhythms of that grace and overflowing. And as I was getting into that experience, as the revelation of that righteousness that I have in Christ, and why this, you know, he spoke things. And my mind was changed. Let me tell you some of you, some of you in the hardest times just need to understand and draw from the love that he has toward you. Because if you never understand how much God loves you, how much grace is available for you. What the righteousness of God on your life can do. There are certain places if they bury you, you can never come out. But when you understand this mystery, the day they bury you is the day they'll realize they buried the seed. It can only grow. We went two weeks into De December. Less of those numbers. We started January and I told our CFO, buy another 400 shares. I want to give the devil a bleeding nose. <laughs> By end February, we had 800 new members. Oh. 
And when that year ended, when we went to December to count the number of souls that came to Christ, February was the month that won most souls. It's as if God was saying, my servant, I got you here. Somebody shout hallelujah. May the righteousness of God on your life speak for you. May the grace operating on your life speak for you. May the love that is unconditional that he has placed on your life speak for you. May the altar that you have before God speak for you. May the vision of God on your life speak for you. In Jesus mighty name. The Bible says my righteousness shall answer for me. And I won. And I won. And from that day, Fanero has been going like that. When I understood that day, no manner of attack ever took a member. You can write, even tomorrow I would expect more. But you switch on TV and they'll be there, ready to receive. And we're buying more chairs. Why? Because I understand this language. Let me say the last thing. Romans chapter 10 verse 6. The righteousness based on faith. Imputed by God and bringing right relationship with him. Says do not say in your heart. That's what it says. What you say or not say in your heart is important when you understand this mystery. You know some of you confess right but your hearts are speaking differently. In Jesus' name, heal. But the heart is like, it's not working. No, no, read. Give the KJV. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaks this wise. He says, say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from heaven, or who shall descend from the heads. Come quicker, quicker. That is to bring Christ again from the dead. Verses 8. Come on, is the computer slow or oh, I'm the one who is slow? But what says it? What does the righteousness of faith say? It says, the word is nice, even in your mouth, even in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. He's saying, don't say anything to doubt what God is able to do. This righteousness of faith only says, what is in your heart and what is in your mind? What is in your heart and what is in your mouth? What is in your heart and what is in your mouth? What is in your heart and what's in your mouth? Your heart must agree with what your mind is saying. And your mind must agree with what your heart is saying. And your mind and heart must say the same thing. Never say negatively from in your heart what your mouth is speaking. If you're saying I am healed, tell your heart. Rebuke it and say, hey, fix yourself. Don't doubt God. At one point, David was moving and he says, Why art thou done cast on my soul? He was disturbed. His, his mind was agreeing, everything was okay, but then his soul was negative. He was believing God for healing, but then he was acting like a sick man. And then one day he woke up and says, Why art thou done cast on my soul? And then he told his soul, Rejoice in the Lord. Stop being down. He says, why thou cast on my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? He says, hope in the Lord. He says, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Next verse. Read the next verse. Uh -huh. Go verse 6. Jesus. Uh -huh. Let me use my portion of scripture. It sums what? 42 verses what? Is it 42 or 44? There's a 42 as well? Verses what? Ah, yeah, this is the one I was looking for. 42 verses 5. You're a preacher. You're going to be a preacher. In Jesus' mighty name. My mouth, it has declared it. My heart, it has believed it. It can only be so, not otherwise. Ask those who know me. Even when I'm joking. I'm prophesying. <laughs> Ask those who know me. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. let's read. Why hast thou done cast on my soul? He, he knows that his soul is not supposed to be in the dumps, but it's acting the way it shouldn't act. 
This is how a righteous man should be. He says, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope in God again, for I shall yet praise him. Who is the hell of my condonance and my God? Next verse, he did what many people don't know how to do. Verse 6. Hey, 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 hey. Fire! Verse 6, fire! Okay, those of us who have the Bible, let's read it. He says, Oh my God, my soul is cast within me. And he says, Therefore, I will remember thee from the land of Jordan and the Harmonites for the deal of what? From the hill of what? Now, many of you don't understand what this means. Let's read it in the message version so you understand what it means. Let's go to the message version. Listen, I have verses 5. Verses 5. Verses 5. Uh huh. 1, 2, 3, let's go. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Soon I'll be praising. He what? And he what? Next verse. Verse 6. Aha, uh -huh, let's go. When my soul is in the dark, I rehearse everything I know of you. When my soul is in dumps, I rehearse everything I know of you. You get a report from the doctor and say, but you are good. You are a healer. You are a God that lifts men. You transform, you redeem. You change, you feel. You are a God that changes things. And when he says that I rehearse from those things and then he speaks of Mizpah, he's speaking about the past wars that God won through him. When you're reading about Mizpah Heights and the Harmon Heights and Mount Mizar, he's talking about the victories God gave him there. Those were hard battles where he thought he could not go through. And then he rehearses, he goes back and says, but I remember in 1992 when they were going to deport me and they told me your papers are ready and something changed and I found myself here. And, and, and for my sake, I go back, I remember that day when I was on that bed and the doctor told me I was going to die. And then you told me you will not die, but you live to see the salvation of the Lord in the land of the living. What is the poisonous plan of a man writing on me on Facebook when you got me from there? I remember that day when I knew that I was gone. This was the end of my relationship. And somehow God made a way and brought the man that you needed when doctor said you can never have a child and you went to a doctor and they told you you're pregnant that moment when they said you cannot succeed you will never go to university and not only did you go to university you got a degree and got a master's degree that day when they said that you can never amount to something and then you woke up one day and you are the one educating the people who thought that you'd never become anything you start rehearsing And as you're rehearsing, the power that raised Jesus from the dead starts putting things alive because you're reminding yourself, I have been in such places before. I have received a report like this before. I have been condemned like this before. I've been accused like this before. I've been abused like this before. I have even thought of myself before. Remember the day when you were going to commit suicide. You bought poison, put it in your room, but something told you, not yet, not yet, not yet. And you're still a life in spite of all that has been spoken.
They said he will not stand. Give him a year. Give their marriage months. Look at you making 10 years. When they gave you months with that woman and you think God will leave you when you need him, it is not possible. The God that kept your marriage will preserve the anointing on your life. The God that kept your marriage will keep your boys. The boy that kept your marriage will keep your career. That is the righteousness of God. A man stood on our altar in 2016 and told them if I be a prophet of God, Apostle Grace is dying in 2016. 2022, my heart is still beating. So whatever comes to kill me, I remind of that expiry date of 2016. I remind it of the year before when the doctor wrote me off. I remind it of the words that, oh, some of you survived an accident. Things other people cannot survive. Tell somebody I'm not here by chance. Hey. Tell them I'm not here by mistake. I'm not a product of coincidences. I'm not a victim of circumstances. I have a story. The righteousness of God is upon me. And he that began a good work in me, he shall accomplish it. To the day of Christ, I shall live and not die to see the salvation of the Lord in the land of the living. The Lord is my shepherd. Tell them, I shall not want. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this because now I want to close. The Bible says, for God is righteous. Who shall not let you to be tempted beyond that which you can bear? He's faithful. He will not tempt you beyond that which you can bear. Nothing that is coming your way. You cannot win. Before they gave you that report, God knew you could handle it. Before that man left you, God knew you could still raise those kids. Before they gave you the report of those fibroids, God had spoken you'd have children. And it doesn't change it. The Bible says in Romans 3, and now the righteousness of God has been revealed. And this righteousness, the law and the prophets, the Bible says witness, even the righteousness of God, which is through faith. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ. Let me tell you this. God is righteous. And he has given you his righteousness through faith. And that righteousness, that right standing of God through faith is the foundation of your prayer life. I boldly go in the presence of God and I say, Father, I know that I don't claim right because of what I did. But I claim right because of what you did through Christ. And I have that right to say that I'm your righteousness 
through Christ Jesus. Not according to my activity. And even if I live right and I do, it still does not match to the righteousness that you give a man through faith. Because it's not of works. And my righteousness is as filthy rags. But I stand on the righteousness that you have given me through Christ. And you told me the only way I can access it is by faith. That I just need to believe that I'm your righteousness. And your rightness clothes my lips and anoints my countenance. It consecrates my confessions and establishes the authority that I have by you. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke that spirit of infirmity and disease. And the moment I make that prayer, much power is availed. And then I say, when this man prays, people heal. Why? Because I'm standing in the righteousness of God. You're going to make a prayer. Not because of what you did last week. Forget what you even did yesterday. I want to charge you by God. To stand entirely on what God has done through Christ. And say because you sent Jesus. I have right standing with you through faith. And because my heart and mind agree to this righteousness. Now I am going to fervently pray. And trust me. Many of you in this room tonight are going to walk out with a miracle. <clears throat> I met a woman who had spent more than 10 years barren. And she came to me for prayer and I told her, this is your problem. When you were 15, you aborted and you've never forgiven yourself. Even when you ask for forgiveness and God forgave you you never forgive yourself you're building your own righteousness to earn a child yet by the righteousness of God heaven holds no record of this he forgave you you asked for forgiveness and he did some of you you asked for forgiveness and you he forgave you but you don't think that you deserve a certain man because of your history you think you don't deserve a certain child because of your history you think you don't deserve a certain woman because of your history you think you don't deserve a certain job because of your history you think you don't deserve a certain ministry because of your history continue disqualifying yourself this is only a sign that you are building your own righteousness I told her your only problem is you have not received the forgiveness which you asked for. She told me, is that it? I said, yeah. Go conceive. We didn't pray. In two months she was pregnant. Two. 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 There's one who had studied prostitution early. She was about 13 and then she entered prostitution very early because she came from a poor family. And then she asked me, would God ever heal me of HIV? She told me, Apostle, not only did I sleep around, I gave many, many AIDS. And I told her, did you tell God you're sorry? She told me, yes. But I don't think I deserve healing. And I told her, that's your problem. It's not the healing. The problem is you have failed to receive freely what God has given through Christ. And I laid hands on that woman and HIV left her body. Amen. She had a cancer. The swelling in her stomach. The hospital sent her home to die. It was almost the size of a mango. And it disappeared. Because she committed herself to the righteousness of God in Christ. If you don't have that foundation, you pray 20 years, 400 years, skin yourself up and take your teeth out, you'll never see an answer. But when you understand this thing, every time you close your eyes to pray, the presence will be there. Pastor Moroso going to say this. When that thing came, when I understood that mystery, the presence of God came over me as a cloak, as a covering. And the crown of its influence started extending to a place where even when I was shaking hands with people, they would pass out. 
to a place, even when people just came in my proximity, they were slain by the power of the Holy Spirit. To places, even when I looked at people, the power of God went through them. To places, even when I pointed at people, the power of God went through them. And it kept going and going and growing and growing and growing and growing. And that's how our names are voiced abroad. Because the circumference of our influence continues expanding. And wherever it expands, we rule in that realm. We are advantaged and progressive. If we don't understand that, we can only influence people in our, when they're near us, when they leave our presence. They will not have a feeling of God's presence with them. And many people have not understood this. God has not called you only to affect those who are present. People have watched my sermons and God and healed in nations. You understand? One time in Barara, these people, and I remember the story, they bought a, bl a blind man before my poster who were advertising a crusade. The, you remember, I think some of you remember the, the testimony. They brought a blind man before my poster and his eyes opened. I didn't pray for him. They put him before my poster advertising the crusade in Mbarara. And his eyes open. That's commending yourself to the consciences of men. That you even have a certain image by the spirit before God and how men should see. Of course Satan will see you different. But those who see God will see you different. Amen. Righteousness of God. Now, you've been reading this portion of scripture, but tonight you take it home differently. The fervent, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man availeth much power, dynamic in its working. Let's open our mouth and pray for a few minutes, shall we? And I want you to remember this, that everything you're praying, like the Bible says, all things in Christ are here and amen to the glory of the Father. I feel somebody with HIV in this room is going to go back tomorrow and check. And they're not going to find HIV in your body. I feel that cancer is leaving somebody's body. I feel that the impossible is becoming possible in the mighty name of Jesus. Open your mouth and speak to God. Speak to God. Speak to God. Speak to God. I know it's late, but such meetings you have once in a year, so bear with me. In these few minutes, you're going to save many years of your life. In this meeting, you're going to save many months of your life. In this meeting, you're going to save your life with your children. In this meeting, you're going to preserve the life of your family, your marriage. In these few minutes you're spending in the presence of God, you're going to redeem the things that you have lost over the years. In these few minutes, God is going to turn. He's turning things for you. Come on, open your mouth and speak to God. Pray. Raise your voice and pray.
This is the moment where you're going to take responsibility of whatever has been happening in your life to change it. Avail the power to change your life. Enough is enough. 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 Speak over your children. Speak over your marital destiny. Speak over your ministry. Speak over that sick body. Speak over that womb. Do it. You have the power. Address that issue once and for all. tonight. God has given you the power. God has given you the authority. The righteousness is of him. Let it be recorded in history that on that day you prayed and changed something. On that day you changed something. On that day you changed something. By God, on that day you change something. You're not walking out of this room with that issue. You're not walking out of this room with that circumstance. You're not walking out of this room with that disease. You're not walking out of this room with that rejection. You're not walking out of this room with that pain. You're not walking out of this room with that frustration. You're not walking out of this room with that reproach. You're not walking out of this room with that with that. Hatred, that bitterness, that anger. Three minutes to go. Come on. Press on. Press on. Press on. Press on. Rehearse everything you know about God. Rehearse everything you know about God. I know that you are a caring God. I know that you are a merciful God. I know that you are a forgiving God. I know that you are a wise God. I know that you are a true God. I know that you are a changing God. I know that you are a miracle worker. The covenant keeper. I know that you're a transforming God. I know that you're a God of understanding. I know that you're the God of knowledge. I know you're the God of deliverance. I know you're the God of multiplication. I know you're the God of strength. You're the God of health. You're the God of peace. You're the God of joy you're the god of victory you're the god that does the impossible you're the god that raises valleys that levels mountains that makes the crooked spots straight you're the god that breaks the bands of the wicked with you we run through fences we run through walls we break through armies we fought high places. You're the lift of our head. You're the kinsman redeemer. You're our comforter. 
You are counselor. You are light. You are the glory and the lifter of my head. Oh, Shabbat spirit tells me that I should give you two more minutes. Somebody needs to finish with something. I know it's late and I'm sorry. But somebody needs time. Because they are tired of something. You must go to the next level. You must not be around this mountain. You must go beyond this mountain. You cannot continue going around the same disease. Same sicknesses with the doctors. continue dealing with the same issues they've got to end tonight healing is taking place Deliverance is taking place. Answers are here. Now I want you to take the next two minutes. And I mean it. The next two minutes. Giving God a clap offering like you know. That something on your life. Has changed because of this sermon. Two minutes I'm timing you. Come on. That's an act of faith. Praise him as you clap your hands to Jesus. Believe it in your heart. Do not say in your heart. How? Just believe and know that it is done. Two minutes. Two minutes. We're going to give him a clap offering of two minutes. As you do that, you're thanking him. Keep clapping. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, keep clapping. Keep clapping. Two minutes. Don't stop until I tell you. This is a prophetic work. One minute to go. Thank you for Familero. Thank you for his voice. Thank you for my body. Thank you for my marriage. Thank you for my career. Thank you. Thank you for the vision. Thank you for my ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 30 seconds to go. 
Some of you are going to trace yourselves back to this day. That your prayer life changed. Your understanding of God changed. Now let me do two things before we close. One, if you're not born again and you're in this room and you want to give your life to Jesus, come now and I pray with you. Come. Don't be afraid of anybody. Nobody's going to take you to heaven. Nothing I've said makes sense if you have not given your life to Jesus. So if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, come right now and receive him. Somebody's already here. Come. There's somebody you're there. You're saying, today this is my day. Come and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Come. There's no point of continuing to hide under things that cannot build you. Things that cannot help you. Things that cannot advance or advantage you. This is your day. This is your moment. Don't wait for any more special day than this. It's not there. Come right now and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And as a prophet of God, there are two people on my left on that row. You're supposed to be here on that row. There are two people who are not born again and you're supposed to be here come now and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior there is one person in this room and you need to come now and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior I'll give you that opportunity you have the choice to or not but you know yourself come and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior come 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 If you don't, at least we gave you the opportunity to what? To come. But this should be the day you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, those of you who came with disease, you're healed. Mental illness is healed. It's healed. Somebody had a pain in your chest. You've not been breathing well. You're healed. In the mighty name of Jesus. Some of you are getting married very soon. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the progress of his voice ministry. You're not going to walk. You will run. And you will run shortly and fly. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout hallelujah. And secondly, we're, we're going to take an offering. I think you have the bags around. Yeah? Okay. As those bags come, just allow me to bless your offering. It's for his voice, church, by the way. Not me. Okay? Father, we thank you for the ministry of his voice and whatever you have done and 
I know you have spent a lot for these conferences and even our giving might not be enough but we pray may you continue to bless this ministry as a ministry financially and I pray for every man and woman that's going to give with whatever God has told you to give may he bless it and may it be a memorial for the word that you have heard today in Jesus name now woman of God repeat these words after me say Lord Jesus I thank you because you shed your blood for my sins and you were raised for my glory today I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior I'm born again Amen Father we thank you for this woman no no you're done let me pray for you Father I thank you for this woman's life and everything that begins with her today which is not only going to change her life but change her family and may the Lord 